Okay, great. So, good morning. The uh, lectures that we are talking about here is about reservoir fluid monitoring. Today, we have the second lecture module. The way I usually um, teach my lectures is by starting with the summary of the previous lecture, and then I continue where I left off in the previous lecture. So as you, uh, we have approximately 80 slides today. So I'll be talking a little bit faster because I want to get through them. And then I leave it up to you to ask questions and make me repeat parts in the question and answers because then you are responsible for going over time, not me. So um, in any case, so let's go to the first slide. The um, last time we stopped at the through casing resistivity. So today we are covering the through casing resistivity until the value derivation. Um, and I still have some um, examples for the um, uh, micro seismic in here. I will skip that because we are going to have a separate micro seismic lecture. So as last lecture summary, one of the key elements in doing electromagnetic measurements is to always, and we just started this discussion with it. I mean, it's, we don't know whether the results we're getting are right. And until the very end, when you drill it, and then we hope they're right. Well, you know, I have an advantage over you. I'm 65 years old and I have been doing this for over 40 years. Um, and I've had my fingers crossed behind my back the first 20 years until I realized that all of these results are correct after we build a borehole tool and we actually measure it and we realize that electromagnetics works most of the time. There has only been one survey in my entire career where I threw the data away. All other data were always correct. And there were surveys done by some of my Chinese colleagues that nobody liked and everybody was complaining about. And that was mostly because of the English in the report. And um, since some of them were my students, I always read through the entire report and was open-minded. And in hindsight, most of those results were also always correct. So I don't think it has anything to do with the individuals. Yes, you can screw up. And the survey I threw away had also to do with my ego maybe. So the key issue is anisotropy. We need to understand anisotropy. The scale here is um, 25 meters, which is reservoir scale. And if we go down to a logging tool scale, which is two and a half meters or uh, two feet um, resolution, we see the anisotropy everywhere. The yellow are the sands and the dark ones are the conductive layers, the clays in most cases, but it could also something else. And if we look at a scanning electron microscope, we also see that we have anisotropy in it. In surface measurements, we recognized anisotropy in the 70s where the magnetic field cannot see the anisotropy. So for the earthquake prediction, we are seeing much more coarse models much larger averages. So let's get back to the discussion we had before. So if we would use this for earthquake prediction and we're looking for magma chambers uh, moving, then um, the magnetic field necessarily doesn't see it, but it sees conductive changes. Here we add some resistors, reservoirs, and only the electric field sees it. But what we are adding, um, a 50 meter thick reservoirs here at two kilometers depths, and so when you look at seismoelectric signatures, you're talking about millimeter anomalies at the interface and they are charge anomalies. And that means that they are partially neutralizing themselves because they're maintaining themselves at the interface. So it's very, very much unlikely that we have some piezoelectric effect of a larger scale in earthquake prediction. Um, so this is, you have to, well, we're recording this, so you can get this back. I've never said this in a lecture. It's only because of your prior discussion on uh, earthquake prediction. Um, thin layers uh, amplify the anomaly. It's known as a thin layer effect um, in the scientific literature. In the commercial literature, they call it direct hydrocarbon indicator. It is indirect because it comes from the interface itself, not from the layer 
that um, energy gets carried to these thin resistors by charges at the interface that stay there. So the electromagnetics go through the thin layers just like they would uh, go through a capacitor. And if you remember from high school physics, where they demonstrated the capacitor, when the capacitor gets bigger, boom, the charges are all of a sudden gone. So the thin layer effect has a certain threshold um, at which you don't see it anymore. That's why you have to do modeling of every specific reservoir when you're trying to determine if you can apply electromagnetics. Again, we last time discussed the models. On the left side, we have a scanning electrode microscope, scanning electron microscope model. Um, this is one millimeter. On the right side, we make a rock model out of it, which consists out of grains and uh, fluids in the pore space. And in this case, the dark lines are showing that the grains are water wet and the red ones are oil. Um, and then when we go further, we make a model out of it, out of spheres. And I discussed last time that this shows you that you can get a maximum of normal um, uh, clastic models of approximately 48% um, porosity. So if you have larger porosity, you have fractures in play. We also related that to um, permeability and the permeability is related to the shape of the grains. If you have large flat grains, then you have a large permeability and permeability is always anisotropic because of the grain size. And if you have um, um, small uh, irregular grains, then the uh, permeability anisotropy is the smallest. Uh, which you can see here, it's about 10, the ratio. Um, oh, here it's also very small. These are big rounded grains, um, but regularly shaped. And But if you have them elongated, flat grains, you'll uh, get a large permeability. Now, we obviously will always have um, um, elongated grains because of uh, gravity. And a lot of these grains are coming from riverbeds. So they're not really um, washed like pebbles. They are washed down as uh, uh, rocks. And so that's why you have um, these larger grains. So next, we um, looked at the hydrocarbon bearing reservoir where we have sand, a sand lens in, um, or a reservoir lens sealed uh, in a formation. And if we make a zoom, we have in this hydrocarbon barren reservoir oil zones, tight zones, uh, different porosity zones. And at the bottom, we have what's known as the water lag. Uh, always the pore space in the subsurface is filled by water unless there are hydrocarbons in it. Um, and it's always uh, liquid. You don't really have gas pockets at great depths. Gas will be liquefied under pressure. Um, so uh, you um, always see it and you have variations in here. So you need to define a large number of parameters through the resistivity models. And that's why you use different resistivity tools, namely um, galvanic tools that inject an electrical currents with various sensors. They are called lateral logs or um, uh, normal logs. Russia still has a lot of normal logs or induction logging tools where you have, um, where you induce a current flow in the subsurface. Induction logging tubes work well in conductive formations below, let's say, 70 ohm meters. And above 100 ohm meters, mostly the lateral logs work in more resistive formations. Both of them cannot really see resistivities above two, 300 ohm meters. So when you see a log with higher resistivities, that is always the ability of the engineers to uh, extract information out of the saturation range of the amplifiers. Next, we will look at the importance of actually measuring anisotropy. And uh, here's an example on the left from Baker, on the right from Schlumberger. Both show approximately 40% more oil. You have the vertical resistivity and the horizontal resistivity derived from the 3D induction log. Um, you can see it clearly here. Um, there uh, you have the uh, deep measurements and the vertical and horizontal. This inversion is smoothed. This inversion is blocked. 
simply because the uh, uh, Schlumberger inversion is done by engineers and the Baker inversion done by geophysicists. Uh, but at the end, I think now when they deliver product, they also smooth it. Um, and the orange is the additional oil from the vertical resistivity. And the here you have um, the oil saturation from the vertical resistivity you get in addition. And this is from the horizontal on the Schlumberger track. So they both show examples um, where the 3D induction lock delivers significantly more oil. There's very little published in the literature about these tools because both are making uh, a huge profits with these tools because they work so well. And also oil reserves are usually not um, given away. So nobody gives publication rights for logs from oil reserves and the customers always own the data. We talked about through casing resistivity, we have essentially the casing that's 1 million times more conductive than the formation. So anything we measure along the casing will have a 1 million times different signal than the signal from the formation. We inject the current, the current leaks into the formation when we put a return electrode here. And then we measure the current going along the casing at two spots. And then we take the difference between them. So you can imagine, not only do we have to measure small uh, voltages. You measure current by measure the voltage difference. But we also have to measure an even smaller voltage difference between those two. And it's so small that it's barely possible digital that you have to do that analog because you are working well inside the noise level of copper wire because of the conductivity contrast of one million between the casing and the formation. Anyway, we built a tool and it worked very well. Um, and uh, here is um, um, a log. Um, this is actually a log from Chevron and they used in red the Baker uh, through casing resistivity tool and in blue the Schlumberger one. Um, and the Schlumberger one is a little bit more noisy but they both work similar well. And the induction log was of course measured before the casing. That's why the resistivity is different. Now we stopped here last time by saying is we need to look at the noise. We can measure millivolts with lateral log tools or galvanic tools, microvolts with induction tools with a through casing resistivity. We are in the normal noise level. Um, so three nanovolts is the limit of the voltage measurements, which is approximately here, which is approximately here. And then when we do deep breathing tools, and I'll show you some example, we have to use tricks to get the voltages below that. Also used in reservoir monitoring is Crosswell electromagnetics in particular in Saudi Arabia. And uh, the last thing I explained last time, you have a transmitter that, in, uh, that sends an electromagnetic field and a receiver at low frequency, you measure the response and you plot the resistivity of the um, the resistance that you measure along the path between transmitter and receiver, then you move the receiver, you plot another one, then you move the transmitter and you do the same thing again. And you end up with several, several resistance values for each of these grid points. And you finally end up with, um, this is field data, not field data. Sorry about that. Um, you end up with, um, I'm sorry, I have to take notes to fix this as a slide 13. And um, you have here the data, and this is the inversion results, the synthetic data. Um, and um, you can essentially match the results by modeling. Now, another way to do it is you have um, measurements inside the borehole and what you wanna do from one borehole, not only get three meters deep into the formation, which a normal logging tool would do, but you wanna get 200 meters deep into the formation. So building a tool that is large space is, has very high value because you're extending deeper into the formation. Here um, is a test with a tool like this. Uh, a feasibility study where you have a transmitter and a receiver and you're trying to look tens of meters away from the well bar. These are the modeling results and clearly you can see a difference in a horizontal well 
where you have water corning, you are producing the well and the water gets sucked up from the bottom and you want to define the distance. So this is quite possible. There's only one problem. You need 13 decades of dynamic range. And as I said before, the voltages are very, very small. So you need to use a lot of geophysical tricks and electrical engineering tricks to do this. And um, you need to add this in sensor design, filtering and transmitter. And this is the lowest threshold you can do. Um, and we are trying to extend below that threshold. Um, and here are some real data. Uh, we actually built a tool like this, a prototype that we tested uh, on land and uh, simulated. And the black lines are the data. So we pinned the data to increase the gain and <coughs> overcome the dynamic range. <coughs> so we essentially pinned the data right here. Boom. These are models and this is real data. Then we modeled three different um, uh, resistivities at um, uh, 15 meters away from the tool. And you can see that one resistivity matches the data in red and the blue one and the green one do not match the data, but they're in the outlying range. Um, this is the tool and the test was done sideways and vertical. This is a transmitter, here's the transmitter itself, uh, the uh, electronics that we built and uh, the receiver on another piece of pipe uh, further away. And we did this essentially on the beach near um, Galveston. So now we are going over to the reservoir monitoring. And in reservoir monitoring, you are trying to determine which, which technique gives you the best um, sensitivity to um, potential uh, water floods. So we are now establishing the link. We are looking at the different methods, seismic, electromagnetics, and gravity. And um, we are looking at the sensitivity to distance. Nobody beats seismic. Um, fluid sensitivity is poor. Surface to surface is excellent. Ball to surface is all excellent. So now we are looking at synergy. EM can detect the fluids much better, and it can work surface to borehole. But in the other ones, it's OK. Gravity is poor in all respects. That's because uh, you cannot really build a sensor that's sensitive enough to see these small anomalies. And we, when we look at synergy, then we can see if we take seismic and electromagnetics, then that's the best synergy. So you want to go after the combination of seismic and electromagnetics. Next comes from the Goa field uh, in Saudi Arabia, where the uh, uh, the the objective was to measure water fingers into the um, oil, um, and for that reason, uh, Saudi Aramco actually drilled a test well. The, the experiment was never finished, and the test well was abandoned. The main reason is that they didn't really have water fingering in the oil reservoir. It was dry oil, so there was very little water in it. Um, but anyway, let's go through the example. So we took the reservoir simulator, we simulated the change of the oil water contact, we took the response and uh, calculated a changed, uh, um, um, a changed map of the uh, percentage changes. From there, we looked at the removed oil and built a model. Here is the... Um, here is the test well, and these are the receiver locations. And the moving body of the water is right here. So uh, we then simulated that for a period of um, uh, 15 years. And we can see the anomaly moving away from the well um, with time. Um, unfortunately, the, the experiment was not concluded. Um, so in summary for lecture one, that's I'm now finishing lecture one, we can establish a linkage from log to AM measurements. Understanding the scale and anisotropy is extremely important, and um, establishing measurements at multi scale is very important. Next, we are going to reservoir monitoring. And uh, the first monitoring example we will be looking at is for 
uh, CO2 injection. As you all know, we have a problem with climate change. And so we need to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, but also where we produce it, when we burn hydrocarbons and inject it back into the ground. So when we inject it back into the ground, two things we don't want. We don't want it leaking to the surface and we want to know how much we inject. And since there now is an economy of giving you carbon credits or money for injected CO2 in the reservoir, um, there is the business. And so you are trying to define how much you have injected where is it with time? So you do baseline measurements when you have no CO2. Let's say two years later, you have a CO2 plume. And then five years later, the CO2 plume has, CO2 plume has got further. And these are simulated results of the uh, Professor Pantele system. He actually has a system uh, in the building where you are, and uh, he can do these measurements. So this is the change in curve after two years and this after five years. So as I said before, we want to see that there is no reservoir seal breach and we want to know the extent of the plume and how much we have stored. Now, the whole introduction I gave you in lecture one is for you to understand that we can also define how much we have stored. So from day one, we can verify our measurements. That makes our measurements the most valuable geophysical measurements that there are, because no other measurements can calibrate um, the measurements themselves uh, directly to the log from day one. So I give you an example from a baseline survey. Here is the famous model that I discussed earlier the top shows the reservoir grains, and we now know what this model is. This is the pore space, the layer boundary between two uh, geologic layers is defined as a grain to grain contact, the green line. So when this layer boundary breaks, cracks, then we get a micro seismic signal. Before it cracks, we, uh, we are putting pressure and strain on the grains. And since the grains are directly connected to the pore space, the pore space starts shaking. And when the pore space shakes, then the fluids move. When the fluids move, the uh, water saturation inside the fluids, in the hydrocarbon case, it will be smaller than in the brine case, but then they move. And when the water moves, the uh, water molecules that are dipoles, positive or negatively charged, they connect and electron flows. Electrons flow. So this is the model below. Here we have in red and in green, the water molecules. And when they move, they connect and we have a, a conductivity increase or a resistivity reduction. When we inject CO2 into these fluids, they build larger molecules that are neutrally charged because we are using the um, free um, electrons to connect to the uh, CO2. And so they're neutrally charged. So we get a resistivity increase of the fluids every time. Now here, as I said, when we get a resistivity reduction, we see this, and this is why in most cases we observe a resistivity signature before we see a micro seismic signature. Right was some test data. Now, I, this is the only slide I show about uh, a micro seismic. So, in a micro seismic case, you have a crack in the reservoir rock and Uh, this crack can be then monitored by receivers in uh, several boreholes. And then from these boreholes, you can define where the crack occurs and you can map it. Uh, the crack usually gives you a P and an S wave and you map this using the P and the S wave, the hodogram, the distance you get from the difference between P and S wave velocity. And the you plot the hodogram, which is a northeast plot of the uh, two S waves and uh, they are pointing you in the direction where the source comes from. Um, so we use micro seismic to find the reservoir seal and uh, we use AM for the plume and the value part. Um, and so what do we know? We know it's resistive. 
We also know the lateral movement in the reservoir is between 100 to 200 meters. Our client in North Dakota simulated 200 meters. I have only seen flood, flood fronts move on an average of 100 meters per year. So um, that's why I'm putting 100 to 200 meters. Uh, the overburden is always uh, critical and you need to account for it. And the depths of CO2 reservoirs is usually below 1500 meters. Um, again, we are looking at, um, at um, um, saturations, um, uh, salt saturations between 20,000 parts per million and higher. We are not looking at lower salt saturations. So we have a resistivity change of approximately a factor of 10, depending upon the salinity of the reservoir. So now getting information about the reservoir is important. So at the end of the presentation, when I give this to customers, they always say, what do you do if you don't have a well? And my answer is don't do EM monitoring because you really don't know what to do without being able to calibrate yourself against the, against the well. So um, the calibration is important. We are looking at some examples from the workflow where we start with a 3D feasibility, do a baseline survey, processing evaluation. We haven't done the predictive optimization and the repeat service, so I won't give you examples for this, but I think this part is already impressive enough. What is the status? Uh, in the literature, you find people using ERT, which is called uh, electrical resistivity tomography, something uh, Professor Pantelis is uh, very familiar with. It's been tested a lot. It is very limited in depth and distance, and it's very limited in resolution, uh, but it's been tested. Magnetotelluric has been tested, and or even though some of the tests were very successful, like the one I showed you, will show you from Spain, the OSIS are calling for more um, accurate measurements like controlled source electromagnetics. So controlled source electromagnetics is the method of choice. Um, there are other methods, but they are more or less. Uh, so anyway, so we've discussed the crosswell before. So this is electrical resistivity tomography. Here we have measurements done between 2008 and 2012, various stages of injection. And you can see the CO2 blue moving and shrinking um, in this particular example, but this is very shallow. So this is not very practical. The second example is from Spain, where they used magnetotellurics. These are the MT sites. This is the 2D image. This is the log. The CO2 is right here. Notice the log and the uh, interpretation doesn't match very well, a particular not here, and it should. Um, so, but when we look at the resistivity and the inversion resistivity to compare it with the calculated resistivity, we get a fairly decent match. Um, but we don't get the accuracy we require. And so that's why even this positive results, they uh, concluded that they should do CSEM. I'm now talking about a 3D feasibility. What do we do? We do 3D modeling. That's what it says, 3D feasibility. But what we also do is noise measurements. So we use data, uh, the log itself. This is the log from a very difficult case where you have an increasing log, one of the most difficult scenarios. Uh, here we have 3D seismic over that area. And in this case, in six kilometers, we have um, 300 meters change in the 3D seismic surfaces. So we add the 3D seismic surface, uh, surface to the model. And here is a transmitter and receiver along the array. But then we also do noise measurements with various sensors. And here are the various sensors. Here are the modeling results. This was a geothermal reservoir, hot or cool. Fluids and what we have here is the difference between produced lower temperature and higher temperature. And we have the different sensors displayed. And from here, we take the sensor, which gives us the um, lowest noise, which is this one here. Um, so we can see the difference in these curves and get a maximum, um, maximum uh, signal. Uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Pantelis's equipment. 
um, that says camping trailer uh, on the left. Um, and this is his housing trailer for camping. Uh, just kidding. This is the generator with the fuel tank and that's the cable reel um, uh, switch box. And then he digs holes because he likes to kill students and dig, put them in there. Uh, but he also injects currents in it. So he's practicing um, uh, um, illegal interrogation techniques for the geophysics exam. So never do an exam with him in the field. You get electrocuted. These are the sensors. Uh, as they're being put in the field, this is the acquisition system and this is the transmitter. The same system was used in uh, North Dakota. Uh, these are the receivers, uh, except the temperatures in North Dakota were not 50 degrees C, they were minus 25 degrees C, but the system worked without inch for two months. Uh, four transmitters two at two locations, uh, three long profiles, about 126 sites. Uh, here is the CO2 injection point at approximately 1.6 or three kilometers depth. Um, this is the log. We derive from the log an equivalent log as long as it's reasonable, calculate a 3D anisotropic model. The, the seismic horizons are in blue and the green gives us the gamma rays so that we block this uh, inconsistency with the uh, geology. How do we derive from a log um, the model? We essentially take the log, put it in Excel, and then average it with uh, as cumulative conductance, which is the conductivity times the thickness and the sum of it, and uh, cumulative uh, transverse resistance, which is the resistivity times the thickness. The cumulative um, conductance is this blue line, and everywhere where each of these curves break, you have a layer. And then you look at uh, layers that are consistent with both of these curves. It takes about three seconds to do. And then you use the uh, vertical resistivity for CSEME field, the horizontal for the magnetic field, and the horizontal for magnetic tellurics. The survey area was in the Williston Basin and the Williston Basin uh, approximately here. And the target formations are the Boom Creek and the, um, um, the target formation are the Boom Creek and the uh, Deadwood at three kilometer steps. Um, with various porosities. Um, and so um, we only used Archie. You can also use like Thomas Steiber or some other anisotropic um, uh, porosity formation uh, equations. They all work. And uh, you compare 1D model, 3D models back and forth. You have to check your code at the same time as you have to check your model itself. These are the test measurements. You have to avoid power lines like here. Um, these are the receivers in the field. There are receivers near power plant and they're in the snow. And then you plot the model here and this is the power spectrum. So you're trying to design your survey that you're staying above the noise here. So this tells you that you have to um, uh, have a signal switching at 160 seconds or one at uh, 40 seconds. So after you've done this, you end up with a map of uh, different formations. Um, and you have different saturations of 30, 60, 90%. And, um, um, and um, this is the ratio of the resistivity increase. And this is the resistivity themselves and the brine saturated resistivity. So you calculate all of these 3D models and this has a large number of 3D models and you analyze them and design your survey. Some results I'm showing here and what we are doing here, we are looking at how do we have to space the receivers. We are injecting 150, uh, we have the plume being 150 meters radius after injection. And we, are, we ask ourselves, do we have to put 100 meters station, station spacing? And then here, the station spacing is 300 meters. By looking at these different curves with different offsets, we can see that these variations are smooth. So they don't cross, the curves don't cross. 
And so we can interpolate from one to the other. So this tells us 100 meters station spacing is too dense. We don't need it. And 300 meters would be sufficient. So we chose 200 meters to have a certain amount of oversampling and allow us to have some bad data points. When we have 400 meter spacing, these curves cross. So here we have the percentage anomaly uh, between the baseline measurements and after injection of the CO2. And these are the absolute measurements. Um, we do the same for the magnetic field. This was the electric field before. And yes, the electric magnetic field behaves identical. So we're making the right choice with 200 meters. You can also display that as a three-dimensional plot. It looks sexier, but sexy isn't scientific um, rigorous. So here you look at the anomaly, you can see it, but when you plot the noise level together with the anomaly, it's very hard to see what you actually get and processing often gets it out of the noise. So these plots are not the preferred way to look at it. Uh, as a result, we concluded we can uh, see the uh, formation at 1600 meters, which is the Boom Creek. Um, 200 meters is a sampling and the, um, the sensitivities are between one to four seconds, but in the, in the, in the signal and um, um, and these are then the measurements at the transmitter, digging the electrodes, and, and this is the transmitter side. So then the baseline survey was carried out at the green dots. We put Ken, a magnetic field. if you allow me, just uh, inform the students that uh, all the different units, they have all this yellow box, which is the web access, and all the data transmitted directly to the web, to the cloud. So anyone can do a real time the data processing. I mean the quality control action. Anywhere in the world. So we actually process the data from North Dakota in Sweden, Germany, and Houston at the same time. So, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. Thank you, Professor. Um, so these are the magnetic telluric sites. The yellow lines are all of the CSEM sites in these lines, and uh, it took about five weeks, twenty-four hours operation to acquire this data and we ended up with three and a half thousand different sites for inversion. So uh, this is pr what Professor Pantelis talked, uh, talked about. He's a good student, he's uh, listening. And usually when a student asks the question, I said, wait, I'm going to give you the answer in the next slide. But with a professor, I cannot do that. Um, so here the transmitter sends the data to the cloud and we have a data cloud and other layers in the cloud we use for other purposes. So we acquire the data, harvest the data, and when the data is okay, we move the receivers only then. So the data goes from the recorder to the web access box and from there in the cloud. And here's another picture like that. Um, we see the holes, electrode pits, nighttime operations, uh, the transmitter trailer, um, and... Um, And we um, check in a quality assurance, the similarity to the log. And we are looking for gentle variations between receiver sites. And we also do some eigenvalue analysis from the inversion to ensure that we are sensitive through the entire depth section of the data. Here is an example of the magnetotelluric data that was processed parallel to the acquisition. We have on the left side, the data processed as individual side. On the right side, we have used a reference side about 300, uh, 400 kilometers away to reduce the noise because it's a clean side. And we have the apparent resistivity of the uh, plotted here. This is the data. This is the inversion model. Here is the face, the data in the inversion model. On the right side, you see that this noise in the data, this is noise, got actually reduced through the remote reference processing. The inversion results show the inversion. And in the dotted black dotted line, we see the borehole log. And you can see the match with the borehole log is better with the remote reference than it was without the remote reference. And this is the 3D model on the right side for the entire survey area. 
a lot of the data points were too noisy to be used for the 3D model. That's why it's so sparse. Can, can yes, you professor. Can, you know, pro, you are a professor. So can, uh, can you comment on the, I mean, the benefits of conducting measurements MT and AMT during the night? Yes. Here we did the empty measurements first and then the CSEM measurements because it was so cold. We didn't want to shut down the generator uh, because shutting down the generator and starting up in minus 25 degrees C could be a problem. So, but generally because of safety reasons, you don't operate the generator at night. So what you do is you do uh, controlled source measurements during the day with a generator and at night you leave the equipment sitting and record magnetotellurics. So this way you get both data sets at the same time. So this is what we also apply in the half moon. We had uh, all the guys, the instrument operating 24 hours. And we were moving around in order to change the cards, get the data, upload the data, download the data. Some guys, somewhere in the world, they were doing the, in real time the QC. So this is the way that the, the EM and CSEM are working. Thank you, Kerry. Oh, I'm not sure that uh, a professor has told you uh, that what Half Moon is. Um, Half Moon is a test site near Iran. And at that test site, the system that Professor Pantelis took delivery of, he tested. And that's what he was talking about. Yeah. Uh, he was not talking about when the moon is half and that he would go out at night and do some tests. That's not exactly, what Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, and here is the CSEM data. On the left side is the raw data. And you can see it's all noise. But once you average the electric field, uh, with respect to the transmitter and normalize it, you get very good electric field signal and very good magnetic field signal. Um, we then also run the inversions for each of the components. We have five components, two electric, two, uh, four electric and one magnetic field. And the inversion is also on the right. And these are done unsupervised. Now, these are actually uh, have still the top layer fixed, but in, no, they don't. Um, they're unsupervised. Everything is left free and starts with a half space. And these are the matches you obtain. So this is very good quality data. And then you look at something from the inversion. In the inversion, you do some matrix manipulations. And uh, the inversion is usually done with logarithmic parameters because uh, only uh, positive log uh, uh, logarithms are defined. and. Um, negative resistivities don't exist. So when you use logarithms, you can do an inversion with three parameters. It works mathematically better. But when you transform the um, inversion model back to the physical model, which has resistivities and thicknesses, then you get something called the eigenparameters. And the eigenparameters give you the sensitivity to... Um, your response to each one of those model parameters, resistivities and thicknesses. We have 31 layers in this case, uh, 32 resistivities and 31 thicknesses. And so for each of those, we get eigenparameters and we plot them. And when they are like here, distributed like white noise, like here, for instance, you get a stronger sensitivity. You have some holes in it, okay, that's fine but they are distributed like white noise. That means that your interpretation is sensitive to the top as well as the bottom. If it was only sensitive to the top, this would be high and these values would be low and vice versa. So this is what we also use for quality assurance. When we then plot the final inversion, and here we have a final inversion of six sites, only 1.2 kilometers. The depth here is, um, 2,000 meters, these are the storage reservoirs. And you, uh, the uh, anisotropic log is displayed in black as comparison. And this is displayed is a 3,000 meter reservoir. And you can again see that it's very consistent. Uh, this is another section. Um, the first one was transmitter one. This is transmitter two. 
another section. Again, you see very consistent results. When we compare it with the seismic, we can also see that you get very consistent results. Now we compare it with the 3D inversion, with the 3D model. Uh, on the right side, this is the time range which we determined from the 3D feasibility where we have the reservoir response. So we only look at the red square here. This is the magnetic field and this is EY and EX. Here, the data, which is a solid line, is noisy and it doesn't match the model. And that's natural because the EX field is much smaller than the EY field. But all of the other ones match through the entire reservoir range in the signal extremely well. So this is extremely unique. What this means is that the measurements are totally consistent. Now, the reason why this is important because the inversion was done automatic, unconstrained. Half space model, no interaction, no constraints. So this is extremely good quality data and we get a very good match to the log. That is very, very significant. So we started at 10.45 and we have um, until 11 o'clock. So we've got 20 more minutes. We are doing well. You get to ask a lot of questions. Now, the predictive optimization, you would have to optimize and verify the signal and use different imaging techniques to enhance the anomaly and get a much stronger signal and uh, confirm that by developing 3D synthetics. Now in the interpretation, um, one of the key issues is to take also uh, some of the modeling to the cloud through machine learning. And 95% of the computation time um, comes from the 3D modeling. So if you wanna integrate machine learning with it, uh, putting the machine learning in the inversion process is not the right solution, but replacing the 3D model with artificial intelligence, that is the right solution. So that's uh, one thing that you still need to work on. Now, the other part is that you need to um, always understand the geology because in inversion, you have ambiguity and you can end up in a local minimum um, and you always want to find the global minimum. And the only way to know that you have the global minimum is that you have a perfect match with your log. Otherwise, you can only look at it from the interpretive viewpoint. Um, and so um, integrating the 3D anisotropic mar log in the interpretation process is also extremely important. Um, to summarize, we use microseismic to monitor seal breach and the plume we monitor with electromagnetics. Uh, and next we will define, I will show you how to calculate uh, the commercial storage volumes. Um, and so let's start out with uh, the models. Usually you have a borehole model and I've used this throughout, but I have avoided putting this in lecture number one because this is coming in this lecture. But this essentially is a continuation of the resistivity logging tools you had in lecture one. So the borehole um, has a resistivity of RM. <coughs> <coughs> the MUT invasion gives us the resistivity of RxO and the depth of invasion is called length of invasion LxO and the true formation of the resistivity is called RT. N is the layer number. If you invert the resistivity horizontally, that's known as one dimensional horizontal model, but you can also invert them vertically. That's known as inversion in the vertical direction, one dimensional inversion. You add the layers to it. That means you add the shoulder beds. And then you have a two-dimensional inversion where you approximate the log with cylinder symmetry and you now consider the shoulders in it. I have in the inversion lecture from the logging part, plenty of examples that this is important. So you just have to uh, listen to me and believe me that doing a 2D inversion is important. Um, but once you add a dipping bed, once you add a dipping bed, this 2D model becomes immediately a 3D model and you have to do a 3D model. 
in all directions. Um, and here is an example for um, um, a lateral arc inversion. We have um, deep lateral arc measurements, shallow lateral arc measurements, and then we have RxO from a shallow tool microlateral arc. Um, and we invert and obtain RxO from this inversion and um, RT from the deep one um, and uh, vice versa. We, we always plot rugosity effects because they cause errors. And these are the inversion results compared with the data. So you can see that the inversion results match the data quite nicely. There is some issue here where they don't match in the medium term. And this is probably because the invasion um, um, model is not perfect. Um, here is an example where we have oil calculated from 2D inversion results, and we are getting 10% more oil by applying 2D inversion results uh, rather than applying 1D inversion results. Here is another example where we... Um, Kurt. Uh, Sorry, Kurt. Yes. Sorry for that. So what is OIP? Oil initially in place. Oh, okay, okay, go on. And you estimate this oil initially in place from the thicknesses of the resistive zones and the resistivity of the resistive zones using Archie to convert to the porosity. I mean, once you have is, is it true? I mean, can you trust these estimates in order to plan the management of the, of the oil field? I mean, the yes. development of it, really? Yes, that is standard. That is standard. That is a 99% standard. Now, it is not correct. There's an error of about 20% in it. You should use in anisotropic formations when you have thin layered anisotropic formations. You should use uh, formulas for not Archie, but uh, uh, anisotropic porosities formulas, as well as um, multiple measurements. Uh, to do a better correction. Um, but you will only find more oil by adding an isotropy to it because it's all a matter of getting signal out of the noise. Oil is resistive, which is equal to noise. So the better the methods are that you apply, that means you're getting more signals out of the noise. More signal means more oil. So actually all the estimation underestimate the real reserves. Always. Oh, okay. Always. Yeah, this is good. Okay. And here is an example where we compare uh, two foot with uh, a filtering vertical resolution matched curves. This is what the logging companies usually do. They use filters, not inversion, and uh, compared with 2D inversion. And in both cases, when you do any type of enhancement of the data, you are getting uh, more um, oil and here, um, you're getting 68%. Uh, uh, um, uh, you're getting a 10% a more oil initially in place. That's $40 million worth of oil. Now, this is the barrel of oil being at $22. That's, uh, today, it's four times as much. So building a logging tool pays for it in one well. So if you get $100 million, if you get $100 million more oil in one well, at today's prices, you can easily pay five million dollars for technology development. Kurt, how how easy is to build a logging tool? I mean, uh, you told me in the past that it will take. Actually, the problem is that it takes years to validate it and accept it by the market. And say from now on, it will be let's say by default to use this system in order to do, to do uh, this and that. But I mean, is I've, it been, I've been I've been I've been very lucky. Um, I've built many new principally principal logging tools. There is nobody else in the world that has done that alive. Doll built many principal logging tools. Some people make lo new logging tools, they are improvements, but making a new logging tool, um, you have to be very lucky to have all of the skills you need available to make a new tool happening. Okay. I've been very lucky with this, but I don't think that many other people can do that. Good. Okay, go 
Next, we'll talk about enhanced oil recovery uh, example. And um, we are looking at the feasibility and we predict the anomaly and then we design the equipment and then we verify it with 3D modeling. These are the results from the feasibility. This is the seismic horizon, the log, the uh, uh, upscaled model, the 3D models, the anisotropic model, the noise spectrum measured in the field. We also did MT measurements, the area is 1D. It was a water flood and we modeled it and we estimated 10% anomaly. We built a system with 195 channels and, uh, and seismic as well as the M receivers. This was a 100 kilowatt system. Of course, uh, uh, Professor Pantelis always wants to be the biggest, so he has a bigger system. And uh, this is the test, the, the data from the field. These are the seismic data. This is the electric field data. Uh, the transmitter was in this direction, two kilometers away. We put out eight receivers. Kurt, water... Kurt if you allow, I'm sorry, sorry again. Uh, just inform the students that uh, KMS has its own borehole tool that you can measure, there, there is an electromagnetic sensor that can measure the signal at the same time, the bottom of the locking tool no. has the three components. Yeah. No. Just tell us the truth, okay. Professor, professor, you yeah. are talking out of turn. Okay, okay, this is, this is not marketing. Okay. Uh, no, I, I'm, no, it's has not do the market because now you are going to present, your, you just saw before, the seismic measurements. The seismic measurements comes as an output of the data from the KMS borehole tool. This is what I'm saying. No. No, again. Okay, halas. Go. Um, here we have the transmitter, and here we have the receiver. We do not have borehole measurements uh, in that area. We only have surface measurements, electric and magnetic fields. Um, and we um, <coughs> have the field results. Uh, this is the center receiver. We have a 30% anomaly after two days of water injection at two, one, two kilometer steps, 8,000 liters per day. And uh, 400 meters away, we only have a 2% anomaly, but essentially this is the noise. We model it with three dimensional modeling and we get see the anomalies but we can confirm it in amplitude. The anomaly is 10 times larger in real measurements than with the 3D modeling. So we also modeled all poss possible borehole arrangements, which included the borehole pipes. There are dozens of horizontal wells in here. And the, 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 the drill pad is actually several kilometers away uh, for the injection. And so, we modeled all of it and couldn't explain it. So the only explanation is that the water flood acts as a large conductor and channels the current from the transmitter into the anomaly. Um, where is the... We... No, we did the inversion and that's how we estimate it. So, um, I thought I had the lecture wrong, my brain was wrong. So we translate um, um, this that we always try to interpret the data consistent with the logs. We use um, anisotropic logs to avoid the inherent large error. Um, and time-lapse measurements need to be also tied to the log and there needs to be more uh, optimization done. Um, and we always need to compare our results with 3D simulations to get the right value out of it. Now for EM, we require high power CSEM so you need 100 or 150 kilowatt. And in the future, all of this data will be more in the cloud um, and to um, use the vol volume tie. And with this, we are done with the lecture and ready for questions. Thank 10 you. minutes to spare. What? We have 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, though it is nine minutes, nine minutes. So- Yeah, yeah. Can I start? 
Abdurrahman, just a moment. I know that you will be the first. I talked to you before. <laughs> no, just <laughs> wait, just wait. Guys, okay. the, importance, the importance of the CSM, of the use of um, a, a source, a transmitter, in order to inject and record the response from the subsurface is that, um, for example, in the half moon that we did several tests during the commissioning, we managed to get signal even 20 kilometers far from the transmitter. So we got good quality of data. The inverted results were really good and they were very really reliable. So what this means? This means that you can cover an area, you can produce, you can, let's say, prepare a network of um, receivers, like sensors, like the one that you can see on the screen. And uh, because this is the acquisition boxes that connected to the electrode, to the electrical field and the magnetic fields, the three coils and the four electrodes, north, east, south, west, the, east, the EX is EY. And then you can inject from 20 kilometers away and you can get signal. And this is very important. It's like applying seismics where you have the vibro size, uh, um, emitting energy or uh, um, producing the vibrations and you have deploy all the geophones around in order to get a 3D model. The same can be, and this was actually goes back to the original map shows the efficiency of the different methods that actually the combination of seismic, as I told you in the beginning, we, we never say that, for example, EM are going to replace seismic, but you need the EM in order to get good results with the seismic to get information wherever the seismic really failed to get some information. Now, I'm going to ask, what is the limitations? The limitation of using the EM. So obviously, I mean, the best is Kurt to, to give us a feedback. But again, it's something that you already discussed. Power lines, I mean, far from, from um, some uh, places that probably could, could uh, produce some noise to the data, but also what we have learned during the commissioning is that is the if you let's say spend time in order to set up the instruments in the in the in the best way i mean to have the the, the coils horizontal uh, keeping the direction and try to be i mean to have to, to to bury well the the electrodes and to keep good resistance contact resistance then good data can give you good results but please Kurt, can you just uh, let us know what is the the limitation that we have for em I, I think I've mentioned the limitations. Uh, there are many limitations and we are usually very careful with uh, saying that uh, we get 5% of the depths if we do everything correct without knowing much. If we have a priori knowledge like the borehole, we are targeting an accuracy of our measurements better than 1%, 0.5% to be true. And we calibrate all of this, but... Um, you know, that's neither here nor there. The sky is the limit. What we have achieved in North Dakota with the CO2 monitoring is unheard of that anybody has ever received something like this uh, with log resolution, that's unheard of. So... Um, and this was only the baseline, the first phase. Now you're yeah. in the monitoring phase, am I right? We are going hopefully into the monitoring phase in the future. Okay, good, excellent. So any other question? You mentioned uh, MT and CSEM. What about TDM and audio MT, AMT? Well, in North Dakota, we don't need audio MT because we have very limited static shifts near surface. Um, and um, so, and the resistivities are such, we don't need it there. If we need it, we measure when we measure the MT audio magnetic telurics, which is just a higher frequency. And we go up to 20 kilohertz in that. But in North Dakota, we didn't need it because we are focusing on larger depths and we have the log to tie to. So the surface, the surface statics come out in the 3D model. And we did calculate the 3D model for the CSEM, including also a lake. There's a lake in the area, as you saw. And we did include that in one of the models. Um,
you see here, there's a lake. Yep. So we have a model which includes that lake uh, and match it equally well. So we do include that as well. So that's what we use it for. The same for TDM. You, you would only use TDM to get a better well tar for the magnetotellurics. But magnetotellurics is not that accurate. Um, and I have an example where I compare the 2DMT with uh, uh, CSCM, and you can see the difference in accuracy. Um, and um, so we would always have it with us in case we need it. But I don't think that in most cases you need that near surface accuracy because you have a borehole. So it's with Basel, we, in the laboratory, we have the TDM, the system by ABEM with the external transmitter, which means that we can reach the 600, 700 meters depth, depending on the conductivity of the subsurface. Plus we have one set of AMP sensors that um, usually this is what we applied because the same acquisition system, please care. Can I stop you, Professor? Let yeah, please, please, come on. Come on, guys, ask questions. This is it is Professor Pantelis's lecture, but he shouldn't be talking these questions. Yeah, can, can I ask you, Doctor, please? Please, yeah. come on, please. Sorry, I forgot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would to thank you, Professor Cart, uh, for giving us the time and the lectures. Uh, actually, you are uh, you you mentioned in one slide about water fingers. So. Uh, uh, could you please explain more how we can solve this issue? What the effect of it uh, for the whole field? How we can prevent or uh, it, how we can discover it? Also, uh, can we discover it earlier? I mean, it's um, these me, are the water. Uh, this is the water. This is the water fingering. Yeah, yeah. And as the oil is um, removed, you have more water where the beige is. And you will see that the um, that the maximum anomaly is moving, uh, the maximum change. I see. The maximum change is moving away from the vertical here. You see that it's moving away. Yeah, yeah. yeah so right. that's how you would see the water fingering. You would build a model like this. I didn't show the model. We obviously have a model like that. And then this model moves away, and then you would see the water fingering. And the water fingering is representing this water fingering. That you are removing the oil and the water is moving in while you're producing. Of course, what is so, made really complicated this area is the fact that we have some fracture zones, and these fracture zones are the pathways for all the fluids, injected fluids to go through and then you have on the sides the how the water or these fluids push the oil away yes but here yeah. the uh, arab d is developed uh, considering the uh, fracture zones that um, are vertical fractures and are enabling communication between reservoirs so aramco has already changed many years ago their uh, production to limit that so that they're not producing the super fractures, the super K zones, but they are trying to produce the matrix fractures and drain the reservoir slowly so that they're not uh, enhancing the mobility of fluids between the reservoirs through the super fractures, which are the big fractures. So they're mostly using interstitial um, uh, reservoir fractures. Okay. There is one question from Lutfi about the in case that we inject water instead of injecting the CO2, uh, if we can model the micro seismic and the EM uh, using some mathematical formulas in order to predict the fracture, uh, that uh, the fracture within the reservoir that they were, let's say, created naturally or hydraulic. I mean, through the hyd hydraulic uh, fracturing. I, I don't think that the Ramco is doing hydraulic fracturing here, so that's not important. Um, but can we model? Can we model this? I mean, if we yeah, if of we... course, the models, the models that are, exist, the geologic models and everything else, were made mostly for the Saudi Arabian 
reservoir. So this is why you know that you have large fracture zones here where you have more water moving in. These fracture zones extend beyond the reservoir. And so uh, Aramco would not produce through a well in this area. They would produce these wells here because they don't want to enhance the fracture influence and destroy the reservoir. So yes, you do have fracture models. That's all part of uh, the integration in the reservoir simulator. Okay, cool. Any other question? I think we are done. So it's almost uh, eight two. So thank you, Kurt, one more for uh, your lecture and your time. I enjoy this every time, but I'm sure the students also enjoyed your lecture. And uh, we will see you again soon. Send the feedback. Um, the Learning Center has been updated. You will see the last lecture already on the Learning Center, and this lecture will be put on tomorrow. Good, good. I will send you the recording. Actually, he also asked me, Jason asked me to send him a list with all the students in order to provide the... Correct. Yeah. So you can still ask questions afterwards. Uh, yes. And just refer to the slide number as you see it in the presentation on the website. So, Kurt, uh, are you going to send me? I have already your presentation. This one, or you are going to send me the? the no, the, no, no. I have to update it. I have okay. uh, notes uh, of yeah, slides. Correct. Like, there were some okay. errors. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, guys. See you on uh, Tuesday. Take care. Thank bye, you. bye. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Mr. Bye.